on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you to this round webinar on hybrid ideologies. Today, we're going to discuss this quite new phenomenon with uh, two speakers. Before introducing the topic and the speakers, let me give you some practical information. First, this is a, a webinar which will be recorded and afterwards also will be accessible on our uh, channels. Um, and the other thing I have to tell you is that if you want to pose questions to the speakers of today, you can put uh, your questions in the chat function, which you find in uh, uh, right in the bottom of, uh, of your screen, most probably. Um, if you have any technical difficulties during uh, this meeting, please also uh, put it uh, uh, in, in the chat to us or to, in the Q&A and we will try to solve this with you. For this purpose, uh, my colleague Alexandra Korn will be uh, available to help you out. Um, so very glad you are here. And today we are discussing a topic which is actually quite new, or that is that of course we are already, uh, a lot of you are already active in uh, countering and uh, preventing violent extremism. And very often this violent extremism was more or less liaised to one ideology which was clear. Like in the last decade, we of course have seen a lot of Islamist uh, ideology or religious extremists, just the way you want to put it. And also the extreme right, which has a long tradition, uh, of course, also rise during the last years, but also as a kind of a clear ideology. And what we have seen, and not specifically then, but perhaps it has risen during that time, is that during the COVID times, uh, we have seen that also all, all other kinds of ideologies came up. And we call them hybrid or sometimes also salad ball ideologies because there's no really a coherent ideology behind it. And this is posing, of course, a lot of new challenges for uh, the people who have to work with it. And today we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk this from two countries, from Lithuania and from Norway, and also from two perspectives. Um, and what we will try to do is to make this, 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 this hybrid ideology phenomenon more tangible. What are we seeing and how could we as practitioners, because RUN of course is a practitioners network, how can we response to it. Um, we will start today with uh, Karina Obana Fischute, who is working for deep, uh, deepung.org from Lithuania, who will be more on how hybrid ideologies uh, will, uh, are present in her country. And uh, I think this is a story that also will relate to a lot of other countries and member states of the EU. And then later we go to a psychologist point of view uh, from Catherine Mustu, who's a, a psychologist in Norway. Um, as I told, um, we will have introductions, but we are really also looking forward to your questions. So put them either in the chat or in the Q&A function, and we will pick them up and ask it to our dear experts of today. So with no further ado, I think we can go on with Karina Obana Fischutte, as she calls her presentation, Hybrid Ideologies and French Movements, a case study of Lithuania. Karina, floor is yours. Thank you. I will start with a short introduction about ourselves, my organization, what we do and who we are. So debunk.org now spans over eight countries. So that's the Baltic states, Poland, Georgia, Montenegro, and we we'll also have our partners in the United States and North Macedonia. So 70% of our work is disinformation analysis. So that involves monitoring the informational space and looking for threats. Also election time is always a hot time for us, hot period. So we are trying to monitor what's happening there to see if there are attempts to manipulate the public space. Also, we organize community training and also carry out media literacy campaigns and media literacy. It's the latter 30% of our work. So we try to reach various groups of various ages, starting from students and ending with their teachers. So uh, a bit of context about Lithuania, how fringe movements why I called the, why I reference French movements in Lithuania, because 
the it's quite difficult to place them on the political spectrum. It's quite difficult to say either they're left or right because their uh, ideology, basically things that they stand for, stand in air quotes, is quite adaptable depending on what is happening at the moment. It's quite an opportunistic approach, quite a populistic approach that they're doing. And uh, what's important also to stress is that in Lithuania, leaders of these fringe movements as of late are trying to go into the political, uh, political scene. They're trying to participate in municipal elections. Also, uh, there is a, one, a presidential candidate that's highly supportive of the fringe movements and the, and the narratives that they prolong, proliferate. But I just want to share take Lithuania as a case study and because we're constrained, quite constrained on time. So I just wanted to present two cases of last year. This is when we really saw the awakening of this fringe movement, the Great Family Protection Group that organized the Great Family Protection March, which was against the genderist agenda, LGBT propaganda, what and other anti-constitutional policies, basically, that's uh, that's what they utilize, basically, in in uh, just providing context for their for what they're protesting for, against, or for. It's the protection of the constitution. That's probably the main thing. But again, if you would uh, the threats that they protect the constitution for from are quite adaptable, depending on. You know, depending on what kind of topic they want to cause distress for, and this we saw that in August they were the same people will were again protesting, but this time they were protesting against new COVID restrictions, and uh, yeah, again they were uh, saying that the restrictions are unconstitutional. They are preventing uh, movement of 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 people. They are discriminatory. They were the green pass, the QR code was called um, uh, the new genocide. So basically it was at first a demonstration and it quickly turned into a violent riot and 22 police officers were harmed and a big investigation was started and also journalistic investigation was carried out, which showed that a lot of these people were present uh, during the anti-NATO protests uh, almost uh, two decades ago when Lithuania was uh, ascending to NATO and uh, yeah, basically the same people are now protesting against against other things. And the, for example, now the new narratives, because the COVID is not as a hot, as hot topic as it was before. Now the narrative is that the extraordinary situation placed in Lithuania because of war in Ukraine is actually done to restrict the constitutional rights of Lithuanians and not because there is any danger to us. So that's again, different topic, but it's placed in the same frame. So how do they mobilize and how they use media to spread their agenda? Also a couple of cases. So this uh, gentleman with the loudspeaker here, his name is uh, Lorina Saragelskis and he has this portal, it's called Elviana. What's interesting about this one, it has at least seven clones that we know of. So this website has different uh, different domains, but basically it's the same news portal. Basically that's done. So if this one is closed down, that they have backups and backups of content. This person was on trial for enticement of, uh, of uh, and desiccation of a public uh, of public respect. Also, he is one of the main promoters of the so-called concept of public security, which uh, calls for this uh, rejection of power and creation of their own communities. And in this theory, the West is the big, the big bad wolf. Basically, everything that's wrong with the world comes from the West, and everything that's good comes from Russia. And the followers often worship Stalin. And the, as you can see, there is this ad for the books glorifying Stalin and this uh, person tried, he publishes them and tries to disseminate them in public libraries, tries to push them into schools just to, you know, uh, spread spread his his good word. Let's, let's call it this, like this. 
Then the next one uh, is called Minfo. As you can see, they have quite a big following on Facebook too. Now it's 50K followers, 42K, uh, 42K likes for a country such as Lithuania, which is quite small. That's a hefty following for a French portal. So it is owned by another uh, guy, he's called uh, Marius Gabrilavich, and he described himself as one of the main organizers of those two events that I've mentioned in the beginning, the Family Protection March and the riots next to Seimas, our parliament. So after the invasion of Ukraine, he of course denied that there is a war. He was saying that it's a cleansing organized by leftists. And also he, he and his portal that he owns, Info, proliferates all imaginable conspiracy theories started from QAnon, the chemtrails to COVID disinformation. So basically what they're doing is they're using social media to share the links to their own portals. And what they also do, they're, that I'm just mentioning two examples here. There are around 70 known disinformation spreading websites in Lithuania. And what we know is that, and what we notice actually, is that they reshare content from each other. They take interviews from the same people, just you know, to amplify to amplify their yeah their their narrative. So what what can be done uh, about about it? Uh, seeing that you know now we kind of grasp the modus operandi, how they how they you know basically try to cause mayhem in the society. So of course, at first it's monitoring and analysis on our part. Those two charts are from uh, the Facebook groups that we monitor. The, there are around 300 Facebook groups and pages which we know that spread disinformation in Lithuania. And as you can see, they mostly share links out of 35, 70% out of the 35,000 posts that they generated this year. There were links, and of course, those were links to the websites, to the websites and those similar to the websites that I've mentioned, or also to those uh, Russian propaganda websites that are not banned still in, 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 in Lithuania, which can be accessed through VPN or some other means. And also, you can see that they generate quite a lot of interactions. It's 7 million interactions, and the videos is even more. It's 21.5. To 21 and a half million views of videos. And another trend that we are noticing that the follower count of these groups are also is also growing. So in this year, uh, it was 80,000 more growth of 80,000. So now, if I'm not mistaken, it's 950,000 followers around that amount. Of course, we understand that some of those are just curious people who want to see what's up with these groups. Of course, we understand that some of those followers are overlapping, but growth of 80,000 people, it's quite, it's quite a lot. And uh, yeah, this is why we're keeping an eye on, on what is happening on social media. And uh, also, yeah, the investigation goes further because uh, as I've mentioned, the social media groups they might look small at the beginning because, and some of them don't even look that uh, that harmful at first from their name, how they how they're called. Some of them are like book clubs or groups looking for jobs or uh, auto lovers, stuff like that. But uh, when we tried to draw links between them and see who is administrating them, we saw that there are actually bubbles on social media. So the links between these groups mean that they share an admin, the same admin. And who were those admins? Of course, there were a few of those uh, persons that I've mentioned at the beginning and another network of the same people who are running the same, yeah, basically the same operation, having their own media channels, more mainstream media channels, having then their social media channels, and then also YouTube, TikTok, you name it. So it's a full time job for them basically to spread spread their you know their agenda. And what is also important to stress here that uh, the because the mainstream media as is, you know, they won't give them the platform to spread their uh, to spread 
basically, yeah, the conspiracy theories and disinformation, they create their own media because now it is possible for them to just create their own portal, create their own channel, create their own TV channel. So that's also something to keep in mind when talking about hybrid ideologies that they have also hybrid media in their disposal so that they uh, basically create this blend of uh, media outlets that they can pull out whenever it's uh, you know comf needed for them and whenever it's convenient for them. So also what we try to do again, what what can be done about this uh, about this problem is of course education. So starting from uh, students and ending with their teachers. So in March this year we had uh, uh, we launched some sort of like a tool for teachers to record a digital lesson for schools on resilience to disinformation. It was just a re video recording with the explaining how this information works. It was shown in schools around Lithuania. And in May, we also organized a full day training session for teachers who work in regional schools, not in big cities, but in smaller ones in Lithuania. And we also have two projects already lined up for next year, also concerning teachers. And we're trying also to target teachers who are working in uh, minority schools, because in Lithuania we have schools that are in Russian and Polish language. So we're trying also to help uh, teachers who work in these schools as well. And yeah, for the students as well, we have created this digital course, which is 90 minutes. It's like a Coursera type course uh, based on real cases explaining how this information works just to give the students the tools, the really practical tools that they can use every day when they try to navigate the, the informational space. So we, can, we have it in English, in Lithuanian and also Montenegrin because the, the, the latter two are the uh, languages that we work in. So we're trying to you know, target different audiences and yeah, just uh, we, the course has proven to be quite uh, quite a good tool because also we see that professors in universities, if they are not, uh, for example, professors of media studies or history or political sciences, if they come from such subjects as physics or uh, medicine, they don't necessarily have the tools to talk about such topics, but it's as important for all programs to have this education. So yeah, this is the gap that we try to fill. And the last thing that we're trying to do is as well, just to cooperate with our institutions since we monitor the informational space, what we see something happening in, in the on the social media or the web pages that we monitor, we submit the cases either to the inspector of journalistic ethics or to the Lithuanian uh, police virtual patrol. This is a police unit. Uh, it's uh, real people behind the behind the this uh, virtual patrol. So they uh, investigate pieces of content that are clearly illegal. It's either enticing hate speech, enticing violence. So they can basically just according to the law, either to start a pretrial investigation or carry out a preventative talk if, if they see that if that's uh, maybe a teenager who is trying to be edgy online, you know, so they're also carrying out these preventative talks with the, if they see that it's, you know, needed. So that's shortly from me. I hope, uh, I hope that was, uh, that gave a good understanding of what is happening in, 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 in my country, but uh, also I'm happy to answer all your questions if you have. Any. Well, thank you very much, Karina, for your very interesting introduction. Uh, and as Karina said, she is open for questions now, so you can use either the chat or the Q&A function if you have any questions. I'm still waiting for those, but I have a few questions of my own, so we will uh, uh, use the time in a very proper way. Perhaps, first of all, do you have any idea who is attracted to this hybrid ideologies in your country because we see quite high appearances on protests but also online the numbers are quite significant especially if you think that lithuania is not too big of a member state yeah so what we see that there is a, a clear group of the organizers you know these agents of chaos and since they are mentioned quite often in the intelligence services reports Weak. It's quite hard to attribute 100%, but 
it is, you know, quite known that there are foreign state sponsored agents who are there to cause mayhem. But usually how, you know, how the people that they target the most are usually either uh, the minorities who have, who might have uh, either Soviet nostalgia from the good old days, as they call, and they have still have this already preconditioned really pro-Russian stance. So from this point of view, they target them, you know, through through uh, pro-Russian sentiment. Also, you know, it's mostly mostly middle-aged people who are from working class who might be from uh, not, uh, you know, might not be from the best like social social uh, environment. So this is where all the uh, anti-LGBT, anti-genderist like, uh, family protection, the traditionalist agenda comes. And the way they frame it as well, if you don't, if you are closed in this bubble of information, if all of your friends are in there, if that's the social media groups that you belong in, when you read the types of content that they give you, it this it might look quite scary, and it might if if you're susceptible already to believing, if you have the preconditioned notions that you already have this sort of how to call it like a seed, and you're susceptible to believing at least one of these things, then it's quite easy to pile on more because usually there is one there is one scapegoat uh, responsible for everything that's going wrong. It's the gays everywhere, COVID, you know, the war, it's the elite, it's this uh, some higher power source, which, you know, we need to try and, uh, uh, you know, topple down. But yeah, to answer your question, I would say that the most susceptible people are in the minority communities and also in the uh, lower income, lower income uh, communities. Okay, thank you. Uh, and other question I have is, um, if you uh, look uh, at, they are protesting against a lot of things, but it, to me it's not clear to what they are aiming for. Uh, like for the traditional ideologies, like for example, Islam, we, we know that it was the Caliphate where a lot of people were longing for, or also the extreme right for a long time had quite clear kinds of utopia they were longing for. Do, do you have any idea where the people who are active in your country are longing for or looking for? It is hard to say, to be honest, because some of them have contradicting statements. I mean, from giving the knowledge that we have that they're foreign sponsored, most likely and most of them are Russian state sponsored agents. It is just to cause mayhem inside of the country, just cause waves, try to establish their, as I've mentioned in the beginning, they are trying to get elected to some sort of uh, power structures, be it uh, governmental structures, be it municipal or even the, the government itself, the parliament. So this and there they could actually have like if it's a swing vote, you know, when it's one vote missing, they could actually have real impact here. So that's the basic, what from their saying, if we would listen, that's the protection of the constitution that's giving the power back to the people and get, getting it back from the horrible elite that is ruling all of us and is paid by Soros money. But in reality, that's basically just trying to find a crack where they can wiggle in, just get to the real get to a position where they can actually have real power to change things. This is, yeah, this is what I would say is the end goal right there. Okay. Meanwhile, we got a question on the chat. By the way, if you put your questions on the chat, uh, put it to either to all attendees uh, or put it to me because otherwise I cannot see it. But now we had the host who found it, so I can ask it to you now, Karina. Uh, it's from uh, from Nikos, and he says hello and thank you for your input. Do you know if these groups and radical uh, uh, activists have contact and cooperation with other groups and persons from other European countries? And another question he has: Are these people voters of a certain political party at this moment? 
Yeah, thank you for, for thank you for the question. Uh, well, first, what we know that uh, they are uh, cooperating with the regional groups of similar of similar sort. So in Latvia and Estonia, we know that they have ties with each other. Also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, some people from Poland, but mostly it's uh, the regional actors in other Baltic countries. Who are they voting for? uh it is we we have we can kind of guess who they were voting for probably for the members of the parties that support them because we have parties in the parliament or formerly we have pol political parliament parties that are not in parliament at the moment but still quite prominent in the scene some of them support the uh, radical radical movements. So we can say that these are the parties that they would vote for. But for example, there's the presidential candidate that I've mentioned that has a lot of uh, support from followers of these like family protection march or supporters of anti COVID, uh, anti COVID, COVID restriction movements. He is not partisan at all because in Lithuania we can have nonpartisan uh, presidential candidates. But he has quite a lot of support from from these uh, radical radical groups. So as I said in the beginning, it's quite hard to place them on the political spectrum. But there are, for example, this uh, party, the party members uh, that are supporting these radical radical movements are from a labor party. That's what it's called, labor party. But it has quite little to do with like a labor left uh, left political ideology for, for what it's known most in Lithuania it's uh, for its ties with the Kremlin sadly so yeah but these these are the the realities of Lithuania there are also yeah members of parliament politicians who joined for example they were on stage during this August 10th protest uh, protest uh, but then when it turned violent they got also attacked. Or there were attempts to attack the parliament members. So it, the, those who are uh, those politicians who are trying to express the support, of course, they are trying to collect the political points. But at the same time, they are playing with fire a little bit because the, these movements they can switch quite quickly. And one day you are their friend. But once you do something that's not aligned with their agenda, you will really quickly become the enemy. Okay, thank you. I have two more questions for you. The first question is, you previously uh, said that you were providing trainings to schools and to universities. And in the meantime, you also said that uh, a lot of people who are attracted to these movements are people who are middle-aged and mostly they, they are not at schools. Um, would you have any suggestions how to reach out to these target groups who are perhaps extra vulnerable, but not in schools? So what we, from the research that we re read before starting, you know, working with the younger, <laughs> younger uh, members of society is that the young people are actually the driving force for change. And this was one of the arguments why we started to target them first. Because I mean, at first, it's quite uh, it's convenient for us to reach them in schools and universities because it's you know a consolidated audience, and it's nice for us to be able to reach them quite in, quite efficiently in a nice setting. So, from what we're reading from research done in various European countries, is that the youth is the drive for change, as naive as it sounds and like maybe bombastic, but it is true. So this is why we started targeting at first the young people, uh, because with the older ones, it is quite difficult because they might be stuck already in the bubbles and to break this glass ceiling and to reach them being stuck in this bubble. It is quite difficult, but what we're looking at right now, uh, for example, on social media, it's all the power, power of algorithm, you know, so what we're trying, we want to test this uh, approach. We're kind of in the in the works, trying to reach them through the groups uh, that they, you know, in the groups that they 
basically yeah communicate and so using maybe hashtags that they use but with the content that is for example fact checking or disproving some claims so that they get served the same this uh, for example our content but uh, being in the groups that they're in. So we're basically just looking for a way to trick the algorithm a little bit so that they can see the, for example, yeah, like small explainer videos about you know, conspiracy theories and why they might be wrong. But again, it, it's uh, really tricky because with conspiracy believers, you cannot, it's every, like every, almost every piece of research that is out there about this topic is saying you cannot go to the person who believes to conspiracy theories and say oh you're stupid this is not what you should believe this is the truth because that's that would make more harm than you know good they would close even more so yeah we're searching for ways to to reach also the older people but for now our main strategy is to rely on the youth and to <laughs> like ask them to help us out in, in, in this regard. Okay, well, thank you for that. And then, and then my last question would be, would you say that you just described how all these websites and internet outlets are connected to each other? You, you, would you say that this is actually a kind of organized way of getting people into a kind of bubble or is that exaggerated? It is absolutely organized because uh, within these bubbles we also see uh, application of uh, bots bot farms which are artificially amplifying the content and then the alg algorithm thinks that oh this content is popular i will show it to more people but algorithm doesn't care about the quality or what this information actually is it seems that it's getting a lot of attention it's getting a lot of likes and shares so that means it's popular and more people should see it so it is absolutely organized attempt to spread the, their agenda to as much as many people as possible to find the cracks and just throw it and see where it sticks basically that's that's the that's the strategy but it's for sure definitely organized okay I just heard that there's one more question coming in, but I don't see it. Oh, it's coming in now here. Uh, uh, from Nikos again, thank you for your input. Do you know if these groups already was it? No, this is the next one. I'm sorry, I was reading the old. Okay. Um, from uh, from Mirza, do you have cover ups such as humanitarian or animal protection groups? Also, to what extent Russian church stretches the influence to the in-group? I mean, the, we do have animal protection movements, human rights uh, protection uh, movements, but those are not, you know, if I understand the question correctly, those are not, you know, they are quite moderate in the ways that they are, uh, you know, uh, that they are uh, operating, but actually we do uh, work together with the uh, Center for Human Rights in Lithuania. So we we, they, we ask them to they, because I, we know that they also monitor the social media space for hate speech, mostly for LGBT uh, aimed uh, hate speech. So yeah, we all also try to provide them with the groups that we see that they should keep an eye on. And also, yeah, this, uh, the same goes with the institutional cooperation. This is where they get to, yeah, they, they submit a lot of cases to the virtual patrol as well. But uh, yeah, the, those groups in Lithuania, sadly, they are not as seen as those agents of chaos that I've mentioned in, in my presentation. I think if I understood the question of uh, Mirza right, uh, is that also if like some ideologies are also to be known like uh, animal rights movements also in the extreme right sometimes are just pretending that yeah. animal rights organizations and then in the meanwhile are also spreading some violent, uh, some more radical views. I think it's also reviewing to, if referring to this, like also like saying we are right. family and by this means anti. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, actually, with human uh, human or animal rights or maybe like climate activists, no, we don't have 
uh, like movements pretending to be fighting the good fight, but actually trying to cause harm. It's more, yeah, it's more the traditionalist, the family protecting, uh, the family protecting groups, which is also, you know, weird because you would never see these groups uh, protesting against uh, domestic violence, for example. You would never hear them uh, taking a stance for domestic violence. No, it's only against the same sex partnership or marriage, uh, right to adopt for same sex couples, right to change, uh, have like a transgender uh, change or sex operations, stuff like that, but never, they would never take a stance against the domestic violence, for example. No. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your contribution so yeah. far. Um, if in the upcoming time, of course, I really invite you to listen to Katrine afterwards, but if you have some more questions to Karina, put them in the chat, because after the introduction of Katrine, we will also have a session where we will speak with the two experts of today. So if anything more pops up, uh, please uh, do ask uh, Karina uh, via the chat and then we will post these questions. And then now we will go from uh, Lithuania to Norway and we also changed perspective in another way where Karina was at a kind of macro level and also looking from the more of online perspective, so mass media. We're now going to the uh, more individual uh, point of uh, view. Um, and how that uh, is being influenced by hybrid ideologies. We have Catherine Mestu, and she is a psychologist, and she is working independently for years now in Norway, and she is, uh, amongst others, also working with former uh, cult members and people who have been radicalized. So I will give you the floor, uh, Catherine, and if you have questions for her, same drill, please put them in the chat or at the Q&A, and we will later on ask those to uh, Catherine. And Alexandra, I think, yes, you start to share the presentation. So, for is yours, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, Karina, for a great presentation. Um, yes, I will talk a little bit about these new hybrid ideologies that we first all of us learned uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, both domestically and internationally. There were millions of people marching against wearing a mask and doing their vaccines and so and what was new about the situation then and especially uh, internationally in, in America is where people who marched and protested against the governments were um, people who were not normally uh, aligned like militia there was heavily armed militia in the United States marching alongside with anti-vaxxers that usually come from more left-wing and alternative medicine. And then there were QAnon protesters or waving flags on QAnon. So these uh, hybrid uh, ideologies we first saw. Uh, and then it's easy when you're in Norway, it's easy to think, oh, that's just so American. But as we see now that these uh, protests are indeed uh, quite domestic and they uh, come, the hybrid, uh, they come together in a single, uh, they unite against anti-government sentiments. So they are mobilizing around these concepts. And so it's sort of, can you help me change, Alexandra, please? Or, yeah, uh, the, um, uh, right. So, What's new about these ideologies is really uh, the fact that the old ideologies, you had uh, a plan of action, something against the government, you had books to read, but now people are mobilizing with concepts around the concepts. And we saw that in the, during the protest against uh, the pandemic, but also uh, the storming of the capital in uh, in the United States. And also last week, last Tuesday, I was in Berlin uh, and can we change slides again, please? <laughs> uh, and once more, thank, um, yeah, 25 people were arrested in Germany 
And so it's becoming, as we see, it's more European, it's more global, that we see these people coming together. Uh, and I, I guess you all read about the case where uh, this aristocratic man, Heinrich, uh, supposed to be the ringleader. They do not accept Germany as a modern state. And um, the people who are members of this group is people from different kinds of ideologies. There are uh, members from uh, the uh, citizen of the Reich. It's called uh, Reichsburger. It's a violent group in Germany. And there are members from the uh, QAnon uh, movement. And there are members from uh, anti-vax um, uh, alignment. And so, again, we see these people who are not normally aligned are aligning against their deep belief that there is some evil deep state uh, trying to take a, a control away from them and, uh, and that they have to somehow take that control back by uh, seizing, their plan was to seize uh, the parliament and uh, take over power basically. And uh, the police actually found information about um, uh, misinformation about the war in Ukraine, misinformation about the vaccines. And so there is a mix. Uh, Martin used this salad bar mix. They're all tossed in together with these paranoid, different paranoid concepts. Okay, so that's a little bit about the background. Can we change slides again, please, Alexander? Thank you. So. I'm a psychologist and, and uh, I just wanted to look at, you know, these complex relationship between mental health and conspiracy theories and disinformation. And it's not like uh, we have a playbook. We psychologists, we really just have to make it up with the tools that we have, how to meet these conspiracy theories and how to understand what drives the individual, what is the motivation. And uh, of course, there are more and more research coming together and, and especially a woman called a social psychologist has done called Karen Douglas. She has done some research on this complex relationship and she says that uh, of course, as we all know, there is a lot of unmet needs of people uh, tending to believe in conspiracy theories, but also we have to notice that especially with QAnon and now the millions of people believing these, this disinformation, there is a certain kind of insecurity, a certain kind of anxiety that makes people prone. Whereas before it was easy for us to say, oh, only crackpots believe in conspiracy theories. Now that's really, really difficult to say uh, because there's so many normal people who tend to believe. And, um, and one reason for that is that a lot of people with high anxiety has uh, a difficulty with uncertainty. And that difficulty, I guess, is also so normal. It's so normal for us to become more anxious and under great uncertainty, we need to find answers. We need to find some uh, solution. And when you go online and you find a conspiracy theory and you start to invest in that, uh, you become, uh, initially, they become calmer, they find that they have the truth, and so it can initially be a stabilizing concept. But, uh, but of course, believing in a conspiracy theory can also make a lot of problems uh, on the mental health issue. But let's go back to the Karen Douglas research. She says that there are vulnerabilities. Um, not everybody is prone to believe in conspiracy theory, even though it's quite normal. Uh, the vulnerabilities are, as she found it, a narcissistic trait. And we have to remember when we say that, that, that all of us have some narcissistic traits, but there, there has been shown that the need to feel special, the need to, to have information that nobody else has, uh, can drive people uh, to search for that kind of information and not just be the victim of that kind of information. So 
So that's a vulnerability with narcissism and that also been echoed in other research that the vulnerabilities are when you have low critical thinking ability and a need to be special and have high anxiety. Those are great vulnerabilities, but also I just want to say just to normalize, it's also very normal to have these traits, but but uh, and also there is a tendency uh, for conservatism, if you conservative ideological grounding, uh, there is a tendency to a stronger tendency to believe in conspiracy theory. OK, thank you. Can we change slides? Please. So getting back to the practice of all this with what we do in our everyday life, how can we meet these conspiracy theories in, in our clients? Because we will not be able to solve these kind of problems with more security. You know, we really need to um, to meet people or the people we meet, we need to really help them um, handle larger amounts of complexity, larger amount of emotion and and doing these kind of interventions because these conspiracy theories and mobilizing around concepts, as we know, can lead to violent action and to dehumanizing others. And um, even though the corona virus in some countries are uh, decreasing, the conspiracy theories are still there. And so we are living in this climate that we have to raise awareness of the climate uh, that we're living in with the hybrid ideologies. They're not like they used to be, but the commonality is the conspiracy theory. So how, how do we meet clients who believe strongly something that we do not agree with and uh karina also were into this she said something we have to fool the technology or the algorithm and in a way that same thing applies um with meeting our clients we have to somehow get our foot in the door and of course, we do that by building trust, building relationships with them, um, first of all. So uh, can we change the slides, please? But it's really, really, we start with this kind of curiosity, of course, with, um, and it does demand a lot of us. It, it demands that we are able to regulate our own emotion, that we are not afraid of understanding or validating uh, where they come from. So I have a mantra that says, follow the pain, because you really want to know what is the unmet need? What did the, my client need? What is it that has happened? And of course, uh, as the, we build rapport, as we build a safe space for them to explore, um, we also have to feel really safe that it's safe to explore even if what they say it can trigger strong emotion in us it's very important that we stay calm and just listen and and remember that understanding something is not the same as uh, validating or believing in it so we really just have to hone in on our listening skills and curiosity skills and follow the pain all the way down to, to hell, as I normally say, um, to learn. Because in their story, in their grievance, there are keys for us uh, to where we can put our foot in the door, where we can fool the algorithm, so to speak. And I have a video. Can we change the slide, uh, please? Yeah. So. I think that becoming a detective of influence, becoming a detective of their unmet need, follow the pain all the way down to hell. That is um, a sort of mantra that I use. And uh, I, because it's so difficult to change people's beliefs, I mean, that is really, really hard. Um, we can look at the research on influence. Um, how can we do this? And I have a video that I want to show and I hope it 
it can play on if you see next slide alexandra this video is about uh, how in thailand they were able to to change at least put their foot in the door on a very difficult on, on a smoking behavior which is recognized as a very difficult uh, things to change so it's a very short film so let's just look at it and and see okay it's working brilliant Is there sound? No sound. Okay, it's actually possible to watch it without sound because... Can we can we change the slide, please? Thank you. So this video uh, showed um, a principle of inner consistency. You know, like all the adults, they know smoking is bad, but they still continue to smoke because they already made a commitment to smoke. But when the children uh, come to ask for light, of course, they reminded all the children that you know, smoking is really bad. And so what the children did when they gave the notice that, so you worry about me, but why not worry about yourself? That made the smokers have a cognitive dissonance. And, and this cognitive dissonance uh, was created here in a very creative way. And the, uh, uh, I'm sure you've seen it before. And this, this, um, video had an enormous uh, influence effect and people all the adults threw away the cigarette immediately we don't know if they actually stopped smoking but we do know that reminding people about their values and about the consequences when uh, will cause a cognitive dissonance and sort of cause a cognitive opening for us to put our foot in the door and one way that I do this with my clients is to first learn about their values, first learn about their, their commitments. And also I invite them to talk a little bit about uh, how does this uh, conspiracy theory, what's it like uh, for them to read in the newspaper and believe what they're believing? How does that influence their sleep, their, their relationships? you know, their day-to-day -day functioning. And of course, in most cases, it's really devastating. You know, it, the more you believe in a conspiracy theory, the more you isolate yourself, the less you sleep well. And, and learning to explore those concepts in a safe environment really helps them to uh, connect with their top of their mind and, and see how this is not helping me at all. Uh, and this is actually making me more anxious is not actually helping me so so that's one way to just explore and um another way is to just remember this uh, the golden rule as in reciprocity the golden rule says that whatever we want from someone else we should give first so when we have no trust in a relationship how do we start to build rapport well, we have to know that we have we have to be the first to give. This is an old golden rule, and and it's demonstrated in this article 
that and I also send the link to the article in the slides here, but I can also send the article to Martin afterwards. And it's called how to make a terrorist talk from a social psychological perspective. You know, how do we make a terrorist talk? And in Time magazine actually uh, reported how they that waterboarding, of course, in our work, we don't do punish people or do waterboarding, but we can, as Karina said, we can come to become angry or authoritarian or irritated with our clients and all or try to argue with their uh, conspiracy theory. All those strategies are sort of forceful strategies that will backfire. It will not help us at all. Um, to connect and to help them uh, connect with their own human uh, humanity. And so in this article is so laden with good advice on, on what to do. And this is a story about one of the terrorists that were part of the 9-11 attack and, and, how, and how those who interrogated him found out that he was diabetic. And so they brought in uh, cookies with no sugar in it. And he accepted the cookies. And, and after that, some, he started to talk because something changed that they were able, because of that, they were able to find uh, this uh, cookie or this strategy. Um, he had a problem now dehumanizing them. So he started to see them as humans. And so uh, that's putting the foot in the door, using reciprocity principles, looking for something to give. And when I'm saying this, I'm not saying that we should buy things because give, listening is actually a gift, showing deep respect uh, for our clients, even though they believe things that we do not agree with and that might threaten our democracy. We really have to try to respect how they came to believe that and and so to help them connect with their own humanity and so from there when we validate people like that when we honor their humanity uh, they can also start to honor themselves and start to unpack their stories and so how much time do i have martin is it a little bit more about five minutes left Okay, can we change the slide, please, Alexandra? So the practical tools, of course, is this in your work and in my work, it's always validating their grief and trauma. Learning more about grief and grievances, of course, is a brilliant strategy. And also not just following the pain, but introducing coping skills like self-compassion, uh, slowly but surely, and also accessing, looking for what is their strength? What is it that they already have that can help them? Uh, using grounding techniques, helping them to see, you know, what it's like to be hyper vigilant um, and how to calm down the nervous system. Uh, and of course, helping them to, to reconnect with family, friends, community in whatever creative uh, fashion as possible, because it was all foster resilience. And humility fosters resilience. And this need to have the answer, to have the truth, is really a vulnerability. And to sum up, really, we have to help them tolerate complexities of life, of emotion. And I'm an emotion-focused therapist, and so helping my clients put words to what they're feeling is starting to process their trauma. And so naming the fear, naming the anger, allowing the anger, validating the anger, working with it and processing it, that is really helping them come, come back to themselves. Uh, can we change the slide, please? Yes, this uh, window of tolerance, of course. Uh, can we change uh, slides again? It's it's just a way to uh, to see that their window of tolerance, believing in a conspiracy theory, then your window of tolerance is very very narrow, 
and so helping them expand that of course and this is just something i would recommend that you watch uh, it's from a beautiful film uh, meeting the enemy from daya khan khan she's a norwegian pakistani who who has always been afraid of neo nazis and and how she used the foot in the door to create cognitive dissonance uh, is by actually visiting people in America who were leading a right-wing organization. And just by her, I think her, her gift to them was really her bravery. It was totally unexpected to have a Pakistani woman turn up and being interested in their values. And so it was relevant, unexpected and meaningful. And in this film, you can see that two of them actually managed to change and to connect with their humanity so that they they were able to access their critical thinking skills as well. So uh, I just recommend you to watch that. And can we change slides again, please? Um, yes, and also uh, I was in a cult when I was 19, believing a conspiracy theory myself and just recently have started to share my story. And you can read about that in the book called Far Out. And also right now there is a, a podcast called A Little Bit Culty, where I share how I was able to heal and a little bit about my story. Can we change the slides again, please? Um, right, we can change one more. <laughs> uh, I just shared the, my story in a national paper here in Norway, and I've had so much uh, incredible feedback, actually, um, that they made another article about the feedback. Uh, and also, so therefore, I just want to say that this is this topic is extremely meaningful to me personally, and the work that you do really needs to be credited uh, because it's so important. Um, because when as a practitioner, you meet somebody and help them connect with their humanity or help them heal or somehow put the foot in the door so that they're able to to tolerate more uh, complexity or think more critically than then you're not just influencing that one person. You are influencing their network of friends, family. And, and this again can, of course, uh, uh, cause a chain reaction uh, to better our communities and uh, resilient, making our communities more resilient. Which so I just want to thank you for doing the work you do. And uh, also thank you for listening to me. Well, thank you very much, Katharina. Um, um, we have one question already on the chat. Uh, before going to that, I had one question myself as well to start off with is you talked about uh, about co cognitive dissonance. Uh, and if we look at uh, people who adhere to hybrid ideologies, we also see that perhaps also their ideology in itself already is not too, uh, well, <laughs> there's already quite some dissonance into this. So mm. How could you confront them with that? Because they are perhaps normal to live in this inconsistency because that's what they adhere to at this moment, at least. I, I think uh, <laughs> that's such an interesting question. I think, though, that when you uh, when you unify against, for, for instance, uh, anti-government sentiment in these modalities, that you really believe that you have the truth. You, they really believe that the state is, is a deep state and that they have to overthrow it. So, uh, it depends on the level of belief when you, if you're talking to a true believer or not. And of course, my work is in, I have one-to-one -one sessions with people. So if you have a, a direct dialogue with somebody, then you explore it in this fashion that I try to say a little bit about. By first of all, sort of finding some common ground, some common, and then exploring to them mirroring back to them so that's interesting um like um did you yeah yeah so we have to have an example but but it's right you do introduce and mirror back the inconsistencies but you have to do that in a trusting environment so that they're able to see and listen to you 
Okay. Then we have a question here of uh, Georgias. Uh, there is a theory that conspiracy theories are in fact naive theories that explain the reality in a very naive way. The people who believe in these theories are not psychologically ill. They are just not educated enough in order to make it a complete theory. However, naive theories are not wrong. They are just incomplete. Could you please comment on this theory? Yeah, I yeah, I think that's right. In I think, you know, some conspiracy theories are even true. I mean, the tobacco industry did hide information about the cancer causing chemicals. They knew that they were in the cigarettes, but they did hide it away from the public. And Nixon, he also hid information about the Watergate. I mean, so we have to, there's a balancing act between uh, having a healthy skepticism and, and seeing that being skeptical to our governments, politicians is healthy. Uh, we should always ask, is this a true authority? And what does he or she have to gain uh, by telling me this? So I have, because, because I used to believe in the conspiracy theory myself, I have operated these two questions in my spine. <laughs> so I try to automatically, when I become uh, enthralled with someone or something, I always ask, is this a true expert? But this, so uh, coming back to the question, it sounds like the question is, isn't it normal to believe in naive theories or can you help me out here, Martin? Did I answer the question? Well, I, th I think I think you answered it, 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 it uh, partially. Perhaps the only question that, that re re remains is we you, you just answered it like uh, the truth or not the whole truth. But now we also have put in the word naive, which is also, well, giving, gi giving a certain kind of validity to it or a kind of appreciation. Would you say people are naive who are into these theories? Thank you for that question. I love that question. <laughs> I think definitely you don't have to be a fool to be fooled, uh, obviously. And uh, that is something that's uh, helped me take away my shame. Uh, also, because I studied with uh, a professor called Robert Cialdini, who's also written the book Influence that I also recommend to everyone. Um, no, he held a talk about you don't have to be a fool to be fooled, just showing that we all have shortcut thinking. We all have days when we are not thinking on the, from the top of our mind. And so really understanding how our brain works with two systems. We have a system one, we have a system two. And what we call thinking is something that we normally do not spend a lot of time doing. I mean, most people are not think because thinking hurts. <laughs> thinking is labor for them. So our minds are lazy. And so it's so easy to be tricked in our shortcut thinking. And that's why I really liked what Kar when Karina said, we have to fool the algorithm. So the algorithm of our minds are the shortcut thinking, the, the principles of influence, like that we quickly just determine something. And so, yes, obviously, no, you do not have to be a fool to be fooled. I think this is also echoed by a remark just made in the chat by Constantine who says, I don't think that uneducated people are attracted to conspiracy. It's only uneducated people are attracted to conspiracy theories. Oftentimes, very educated people, as mm -hmm. herself, are also attracted by this type of narrative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what would your advice be? Because, of course, you are a psychologist, you studied for years, and you have your own therapies and so on. but. If people are concerned about people in their environment, what, what, what should you do or what should you not do? Because they, they of course, have much less luggage uh, or much less toolbox to do so. Mm. Yeah, it's also such a good question. And again, you know, it really demands a lot of patience and humanity and empathy on our part. It demands a radical empathy. Uh, and even a radical responsibility to to help uh, to keep the connection if there's somebody in your family or some friend or as long as it's possible to keep the connection and the relationship going 
and mm -hmm. looking behind the mask of the ideology and seeing the human behind there you know if, if it's not dangerous to be with these people then then stay connected um i know that's really a hard thing uh but it demands that we all are able to regulate down our own emotion and see that this is the most important work that we do now is to see that we're all living together and we have to connect and more we isolate people who are believing these things the worse it gets and so i think in that that question also says something that we can do something every day uh, to uh, to protect our democracy and keep our communities resilient is by keeping the dialogue open. By introducing you, I was just polarizing a bit by saying that Karina was doing the mass thing and mass media and that you were being on the individual point. Um, after this question, I will involve Karina again and bring, bring both worlds back again, but perhaps also from your point of view, what do you think as a psychologist that we could do online to work uh, on this conspiracy theories on hybrid ideologies? Or is this something that should be really on a face to face personal base? Wow. Yeah, so that is a difficult question and I have to, I don't have a ready answer for that one, <laughs> but it is a good question. And I, I, I think normally that I would say that the principles are the same online as in offline, that if we see it online, engage, you know, be brave enough to try to engage, mm -hmm. try to follow uh, the argument or see if it's possible maybe to meet that person offline or to even online uh, saying oh, i understand that must be really scary to believe that or, or and uh, somehow trying to honor or validate without agreeing so this is a fine line of course mm -hmm. but, yeah, that, that is a question in between like people who are very um let's say convinced of their own right and that they adhere to the right ideologies if how do you express that you are listening but that you are not agreeing because if you just well if you and i were talking i most probably would see that you perhaps don't agree but if i'm really full of my ideology and my, that i have the truth in me how can you do this in a subtle way i think by starting with trying to find a compliment, uh, you, you know, trying to somehow say that your enthusiasm is, is amazing. You know, it's, you know, I see that you really believe that and uh, I can admire the bravery of standing up for your beliefs. Yeah, okay. Well, let's go to Catherine. Karina, you listened to Catherine. Uh, did this resonate to you uh, at some points also for the work you were doing at this moment? Yeah, I mean, with conspiracy beliefs, also what we are uh, reading and in, in, in other research as well is that it's comfortable for people who believe conspiracy theories to stay in the bubble, believing conspiracy theories, because, yeah, that's uh, as, as Catherine said, it's a sense of belonging, a sense of importance, a sense of, you know, and this is how these bubbles form. And again, because of, of the algorithm, which is a completely digital, impartial thing. Uh, they feed this like confirmation bias. They feed you what you already believe, and thus they stro they strengthen your belief. So, it, with with regards to outreach to to people, I I would be you know I think at first you also need to assess if you are the right person to speak to somebody who who you see that they believe conspiracy theory either online or 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 uh, yeah in person but also what's important to know about online is a lot of action online spreading for example certain messages those are not even people behind the accounts and you might be engaging with a bot like completely <laughs> automated program you know having a debate but it's you know it's not real uh, a real account so that's also something to have in mind, like operating online. But from what we see in general, 
countering disinformation, countering yeah, conspiracy beliefs. It's uh, not even uh, the concept of, of course, fact checking is important in the sense of just informing the public, you know, what's happening, like debunking piece by piece of uh, some stories that are fake. But what we see and what, for example, our colleagues working in the military, working in, in NATO, what we talk with them, for example, is the forming your own narrative and communicating instead of forming counter narrative is way more effective because with this counter disinformation, like fact checking is one step behind all the time. So I think the same approach could be taken with outreach to people who believe conspiracy theories. It's not like, oh, what you believe is wrong. For mm. example, if somebody believes that the government is the worst and it had done nothing good for them, and they believe so because that's the news they read. For example, if you are uh, in, in the US and all of you, all, all that you read is the Republican media, you would think that Biden is the worst president ever. But instead of going after saying, oh, you know, but actually you're wrong because it's this, it's just to communicate what good the government does. That's like an example that I'm taking with the government, but it's, you know, it's uh, just proactive communication and forming the narrative that you, like the strategic narrative that you want to, you know, get out there instead of being like one step behind and trying to disprove uh, this proof that's already out there. This is what, yeah, with the Russian propaganda as well. It's because sometimes it's so ridiculous that disproving something that's completely made up, it's really, you know, not not worth spending time and effort. Instead, it, the, there has to be like really clear messaging, proactive messaging to take up the informational space. So there is less space for these little bubbles to appear to, yeah, you know, uh, conspiracy, disinformation, or other. Mm. A question for the both of you. Uh, some people sometimes say the things which we now see in hybrid ideologies are to a large degree also asking for attention or being provocative, or for example, by saying that politicians are lizards or that there is a pizza uh, outlet in Washington where you can get child's blood, uh, all these kinds of things. Mm which well, uh, might be not even for people who have a uh, strong imagination might might be beyond. Um, to what extent do you think this is just being provocative towards the government? And to what extent do you think people are, are believing in this? And how should we deal with this? Just a simple question. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you're talking about dehumanization, you know, like, and we know that that's very dangerous. That's a precursor for violence. And so, of course, they might uh, have justified using those in their own mind, which is dangerous. So, um, I think, how should we meet those? Uh, well, again, it's so different on what level we are communicating, if it's in the media or if it's person to person, um, you know, uh, how to deal with that dehumanizations. It often helps to 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 follow their emotion you know like to understand their anger and to understand why it's very often a lot of shame behind some people cannot tolerate their own shame and their own vulnerability so they project their shame on other people and that gives them a sense of power and so working with shame helping them uh, learning about their histories you know that's what i would do if uh, but again you know that's a different in different context. We meet this kind of statement, mm -hmm. but it's definitely dangerous. Yeah, yeah, and maybe also with the the sort of believing from from in my opinion, I think it's for us as people, we would try to avoid this like cognitive dissonance inside ourselves because for for example, like to put myself for example in the shoes of somebody who would just uh, proliferate some harmful narratives just to be edgy and just to get attention, but not actually believe it myself. But it would be hard for yourself, I, I think, to just realize that you're lying to yourself and others all the time or, or that you're, you know, 
not not uh, behave, behaving like in a you know, good way. That's maybe too too plainly to put it plainly. But I think yeah, also if you are taking the proactive step to go out there and post or make a video or or start a debate, there has to be some percentage of belief in it because there are a lot of ways to attract attention, you know. But if you choose this one, that means that there is some degree of 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 belief in, in what you're saying. Of course, it might not be the most. Uh, of course, there are people just jumping on the same train and trying to capitalize, especially on social media. If there is a topic gaining traction and you want to get some followers, want to get uh, outreach. Of course, you can jump on the wagon and be like, you know, uh, as edgy as you want, but I, I, in my opinion, there always has to be at least some some percentage of belief. Uh, if you are going out of your way to, to start a public debate, not even like uh, with somebody, like uh, a person to person, but to start a public debate and stir the pot, then there has to be like more motivation within you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I got a question and on the chat from uh, Nif, and he asked, "What makes hybrid ideology different from other traditional hatreds towards different groups in the past, like Nazis and so on?" It's just the way they mobilize. It's just that we cannot learn about their ideology uh, up front. It becomes more individualist. You know, you see that the hate unites them. Or is the anti-government that unites these fringe groups and of course with the technology it, it's also helping them to connect to each other and making small fringe groups actually a real threat to government um and so i think uh i think i forgot the question <laughs> the question was uh, what makes hybrid ideologies different from other traditional hatred towards different groups in the past like from nazis Yes, it's it's that they mobilize against, you know, the threat uh, to Western values. That's a concept, a concept that can uh, attract people from different kind of ideologies. Traditionally, mm -hmm. and that is a new phenomenon. It's not new within ideologies and movements. There's always been change and fissures and and mobilizing, but that's within a framework. Mm -hmm. What's different here is that you have this salad bar, as you know, that the, there is the concept that is the driver. You know, the anti-sentiment for government or the, uh, yeah, the threat to Western values and uh, what's more, I mean, three percenters, I think, is also a concept. Uh, so, yeah, that's different. Okay, Karina, you want to? Add? Yeah, and I would say maybe the exposure to it all, like compared to the past, now it's way easier, I guess, to find it in a place where you wouldn't expect it to. Like, for example, I imagine, like in in the past, the indoctrination process, let's say, would be done through schools, through really, uh, you know. Uh, conventional media stuff like that but now mm. you can get their content really even without your own consent unknowingly like for example we did this experiment of uh, we took a blank youtube account which the algorithm doesn't know us and we started searching for covid information and after an hour, it was, uh, and later we just followed the next up recommendations algorithm. And after an hour, it was all conspiracy, the sweetest night, the best uh, COVID uh, anti-vax uh, content. This this means that, you know, instead, it, the algorithm could have served us whatever, but it went to the more radical route instead of serving reliable information because of course it's the it uh, entices emotions it entices like especially bad emotions such as uh, you know more we we experience the hate or fear or something negative 
So yeah, and it's uh, it's just how it's rigged to keep the people's attention. So my point is the exposure is way there are more more ways that you can get you know uh, serve the hybrid ideology yeah agenda that that's what makes them hybrid the adaptability and the accessibility hmm. which was not the case let's say yeah in in, in uh, yeah, 70 years ago but that's also well in a certain sense it's it's an optimistic view because we still have innovations and also for good causes we can adapt faster and we can access faster that also means that if innovation goes on and we can assume that it goes on this problem only gets more complex in the future or is this too pessimistic i think it's sort of an arms race technological arms race at this point because the same technology can be used for both for good and bad ai yeah or artificial intelligence can be used for horrible things you know mm -hmm. it, uh, talking from my my own field it can be rigged to just you know stamp uh, articles uh, containing this information the deep fakes whatever but also we apply AI to teach the algorithm, to teach the machine learning algorithms to spot the most toxic content so we can find it and then yeah, just uh, monitor the trends, what are happening. So I guess, yeah, to, to not to be too pissed, I choose to be realistic, to be honest, in this, in this regard to that you always need to be aware of the, of the challenges ahead of you, but also not to be like, because sometimes it is this vortex of, you know, you get this tunnel vision and everything is bad, especially after having watched hundreds of hours of Russian uh, TV. But uh, yeah, just need to focus on what you can do, what you can change. And uh, yeah, it's uh, that's that's the best chance we got. Okay. Katrin, you any more remarks on this? Yeah, I just want to say the same thing. Psychologically, is you know, if you see influence uh, techniques or influence uh, uh, technology, even can radical radicalize people. It can, you know, learning about the foot in the door technique. You can radicalize a person, you know, to getting in. You know, just like Corinne explained that you you know a vulnerable person to to be more interested in more information, but the same technology we could actually use to de, uh, or I don't want to use de-radicalize, but just, you know, to connect with them again, you know, to help them. I myself have gone through that process. And so I just think that uh, nothing wrong with the technologies. There is always the hope in there. And I do think that in any, in any new phase, like we are in an early ages of technology, and of course there's going to be diseases. And so I think I do have a hopeful view of the future. And <laughs> we are learning more about what it means to be human and what we need. And we have to learn, I think, in family systems to give children what they need so they don't, so they feel secure and that they're able to tolerate complexities and, and differences in others. So on an emotional level, I think there's a lot of hope there. If we could spend right. more money on the relationships rather than securing buildings, I would be very happy there. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, and on that positive note, although I started negatively, I would like to end this webinar for today, not before saying thank you very much to Karina and Catherine for your excellent input. I would also like to thank the participants for uh, attending us for your questions. And I would like to tell you again that this broadcast, uh, this will be a, a webinar will be, uh, was recorded and will be added to uh, our media channels. I also would like to inform you that if you happen to speak French or German, we are repeating this webinar in French on the 16th of January and in German on the 7th of February. Uh, you can still register for this over uh, the RUN website. Um, this is not entirely the same because we invited uh, other experts who will give their particular view from their perspective. So uh, if you are able to understand the French or the German uh, webinar as well, please be very welcome to join us then. 
for now, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much also on behalf of my colleague Alexandra, and we hope to see you next time during a round webinar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.